Hello everybody. I want to introduce you to the project Bearing the Unbearable, insight into the world of emotionally fragmented in children and young people. Why is it called that? It's called that because we're wanting to open up giving workers the opportunity to have a deeper understanding as to why some children break down. Now for the last few years, there's been a developing interest in the world and the need for therapeutic understanding for those involved in helping children and young people. When we use the word therapeutic, what is it that we mean? The difficulty nowadays, of course, is that a word comes through and people say, if I use that, it'll all look good. Well, it is an interesting word, but the thought is, who can actually move into the, putting it into a practice which is going to help children and young people to feel better about themselves? Now, the result of this project is that we now have a DVD and a manual which is aimed at giving workers the skills to develop their practice. Many years ago, I was consulting in a therapeutic community which was helping children and young people with serious emotional damage and pain, preventing them from living in the outside world. My work was to help those taking care of them to develop the skills that could help these young people to move on with a much stronger sense of looking after themselves with meaning. One day, a highly intelligent, a very troubled adolescent girl came up to me. She said to me, Ear, ear, Christine, what does you do for a job? Well, said I proudly, my job is to help all those who are taking care of you how to look after you properly and make you feel better. That's my job. She looked at me intensely and she said, Hmm, you're not very good at your job, are you? Well, you can imagine how that made me feel after that length of time. But I said to her, OK, if it's not good, do let me know what you think I should be doing to make it better. She thought intensely again. She said to me, with deep meaning in her eyes, will you help them? Not just teach them, not just help them, not just tell them, but really help them how to listen to us properly with their heart and soul, and really take us in. Then we will feel we are truly being listened to. Not just with what they've been taught, but really taking us in with meaning and sincerity. Apparently two of her workers had been on a course on how to work with sexually abused children, which sadly had been her experience, they told her what they'd been taught, which made her feel worse. She was terribly sensitive and that made her act out and break windows and become slightly violent. I listened to her deeply and I took it seriously. I did work at helping the workers to take children and young people on board with meaning and sincerity. I bumped into her three weeks later. She said to me, mm, you're getting better at your job, aren't you? I said, thank you. It must mean you're feeling better about yourself. And off she skipped. Now then, that's about bearing the unbearable. We're living in a time when so many categories are being made about children. Bits of acting out. Oh, they've got attention, um, attachment disorder. Well, there's more to a disorder than a label. We have to be recognising exactly where that disorder came from and what it represents in their world. Disorder can come about through workers reacting and making a child feel they're not being listened to, as the girl said to me. So bearing the unbearable is really linked into identifying the impact of early experiences and continuing trauma on a child's view of reality and how that manifests itself in everyday living. 
which easily can become unbearable. We all have times when the outside world feels pretty unbearable to us, don't we? I have it quite a bit actually when I'm feeling fed up. <laughs> However, also we do know we can go through moments of fury or thinking, oh God, I'm fed up, but then begin to feel better about it and make sense of what's going on. But if you've undergone trauma from the, your earliest infantile days, which has been compounded with other experiences of trauma, hostility and abandonment, then it, uh, it comes out very, very easily. The compulsion to repeat is very often brought about in young people with huge disastrous outcomes for them. You see, there's more to life than just a good outcome. You're only going to really develop that if you have a stronger understanding about the emotional income the young person's bringing with them. To make it work, we have to address some very complex needs which these young people need and find, what, find identify what in their world we have to support, what cannot be supported but really needs providing for because it never got going in the first place. That's a much deeper area of looking at attachment disorder than simply saying they've got an attachment disorder, let's put them over to mental health. But to really be identifying this, there's a number of important questions that need addressing. I'm going to do a few of them for you now. One of the questions is, why is it that some children and young people are able to use experiences which are being offered to them, whilst others cannot. They pretend they can. They come over as charming and lovely, only to break down and act out with aggression, destructively and self-destructively. Of course, very often, not understood by carers, that can make a placement break down. Say, so we can't deal with that. They're not applied to what we're offering to them, they must go. Well, we've come to learn over the last 30 or 40 years, Love Is Not Enough. A book that was written by Bruno Bethelheim is on the DVD said that. And it isn't, it's terribly important. But of course, for some of these people who've never experienced it in the first place, it simply isn't enough to get them going. It's crucial. What's more crucial is that workers can really begin to recognise the most unbearable aspect of their life. There's a big difference between panic, rage, unthinkable anxiety and anger, sadness and loss. The difference is, we all have times when we feel angry or sad or are going through times of loss. But we can think about it and talk about it. Panic and rage, it relates to a time when nothing could be thought about. In today's climate, neuroscience is outlining, fortunately, that infants who go through trauma, it does have an effect physically, scientifically, on the development of the brain. That's important. But we also have to be asking, who's going to be dealing with the behaviour? who's going to be able to hold on to that kind of experience and make it work at a later stage. Well, the number of young children who need specialist care of most often those who have just undergone early trauma compounded by abandonment, trauma, hostility for the rest of their lives until they've been placed somewhere else. Therefore, it's embedded in their mind and can very easily be recreated when the outside world says something that throws them back into the panic and rage that belong to an early stage of their life. So giving workers the skills from which they can understand and respond to the unbearable feelings is far more positive and helpful to young people than simply looking at how you manage the behaviour. Evidence has proved that to us. 
So that's why some children cannot use the experience they're being offered to them. We have to begin to address the deeper concepts of unintegration that's never been able to get into the second category. Takes me on to the second question. Excuse me, looking down here. How can the inside world and the outside world of the child or young person link together and create a healing process for them with significance and meaning? That's a very important piece of thinking, in my view. Because when I was starting in this work in the 70s and 80s, I was a young graduate with lots of determination to make the world better for children in distress. Now then, there wasn't the same economic um, crisis there is now. There was more room for creative thinking. There was a number of therapeutic communities who were really focusing on the world of these highly troubled adolescents and finding that if you could really develop a culture that reached out to them, it did make them feel better about the world. Some of them moved on, very few broke down. But I have to ask the question, why is it in 2012 a large number of those places have closed down? Now partly of that is geographically and economically they've had to. One, has, one or two have been able to carry on and keep their reputation going. But the other, the other issue is, and this is my criticism of that time, which I have to say I found also hugely inspirational and learning, my criticism of that is also, perhaps it was, that in that time, we became so involved with the inner world of the child, we didn't really take that much notice of the external world, how they could manage and live in the outside world and meet the rules of reality with meaning and significance. Now, sadly, in today's climate, I think workers are so focused on the outside world achieving what they have to achieve as workers. They've got to come up with the focus. They've got to achieve the outcome. They've got to get the good result. They've got to have the evidence. It does not leave the time or space for workers to be able to really take note of the inner world. And I think that may have a large part on why the breakdown of children and young people is getting bigger because we have to focus on the inner world. We also have to look at how that, the outside world, is dealt with. I would suggest, and this is what Bearing the Unbearable is about, we have to find a way of bringing the balance together, that the two can marry together more, so that young person, who's never had a sense of wholeness, that means coming together as a whole person with all the humps and bumps that go with it, can for the first time begin to feel they are really being recognised and taken notice of. What constitutes, is question three, effective intervention and creates a life for them that becomes more manageable and bearable? Which also goes along with the next question. How can workers develop a therapeutic culture which is organisational, but allows space and room for creative freedom in the child and young person's life. What we're saying there is that certainly, undoubtedly, you can have all the emotional creative thinking you, in the world, but unless it's managed and structured, it can get into difficulties. You can't take a child back to being, a 15-year-old back to being a baby. But what you can do is recognise the gaps and spaces are still around in their, in their earlier life experiences, which prevents them from functioning always as a 15-year-old and make some provision for it. A therapeutic culture is one that brings around the treatment where the child is feeling emotionally contained held in mind by the carer and really listened to in a way that makes them feel the whole sense of self is being taken on board. The most crucial factor for any child in need of specialist care is that they move on from you feeling better, 
more realised and mattering as an individual whose sense of self can fit in with the outside world. And finally, the question is, what is the role of those involved in supporting and providing for children and young people? How can they bear the unbearable factors in their lives, which facilitates and support those, supports those who are they responsible for? How can they work with the young people to guide them towards a more positive and stronger identity? Certainly identity and sense of self is absolutely, for me, the main core of therapeutic treatment. What we don't want is to develop an environment which says they're therapeutic, but which is simply warehousing children, that develops a way of working with them that meets the needs of the outside world, and the child just provides a kind of false self that makes them look as though they're going along with it, only to break down as soon as they've left it. Of course, institutionalised factors, which many of our secure unit and prison accommodation is in danger of providing, can often lead to breakdown at a later stage. So what is the role of the worker? Well, of course, if we're developing one which has an emotional side to the work with the young person, it does mean that worker is able to understand what the child is able to create to, to them. As they begin to be attached with the worker, they will also begin to transfer some of the most unbearable, unthinkable anxieties in them onto the, onto the worker. Sometimes the worker will begin to feel to them like the terrifying parental figure that was hostile to them. It's very important the worker has an understanding of that and does not go on to recreate the original experience. It's not easy for them. In fact, I would say, the more insight and understand the worker has, the better it is for the young person, but the more painful it can become for the worker, as they begin to slowly get in touch with the pain of that young person. After all, that is what has often created the breakdown, when the outside world has felt too unbearable and too unthinkable. That is the task of the worker. They need to have from time to time the wow factor. They will often feel, what's the point of doing it? I'm not going anywhere to do this good. I've been speaking to them for two hours, thinking I was making touch to them, and they've broken all the windows. Well, that is what bearing the unbearable is all about. We cannot just go along with how it seems. We have to be moving behind the skin. So bearing the unbearable is a way of trying to address all these areas. It's not an easy task, but if we are to be more successful in achieving a proper outcome with meaning and sincerity for that young person, they move on from you really feeling a person in their own right. They have made a good beginning, which can lead to a better middle and a future development. I hope you find it useful. Thank you.